Hello everyone, and welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim. A while back, I started a circumnavigation in the F-104G by Sim Skunk Works, and I've gotten through 16 out of 28 planned flights, so I decided to start producing the videos for it. It seems like, hopefully, I'll manage to complete it. And so you see me starting up the plane. Actually, uh, I brought it out, you know, supposedly started up onto the runway, but still with the Sim Skunk Works F-104, you need to do a few things, like flick the generator switch, uh, start the... Uh, navigation system and stuff like that and also make sure that you've got all the fuel because for each of these flights we're going to be trying to go for the max range at max speed with the plane as well I, I need to get a lot more practice as you can see a little bit off on the takeoff there but we've got the pylon tanks we've got the wingtip tanks making it very hard to take off with this and the reason I decided to do a circumnavigation with this plane is because it's by far the hardest plane to fly in flight sim that I've got. Uh, it is very finicky. You do not want to try to use this for sightseeing because it's not very good at low speeds and if you try to maneuver around stuff at uh, low altitudes you are likely to crash. So yeah, overall it's a very challenging plane and that's why I decided to fly it on this flight. It's challenging to get it past Mach 1 and get to its close to its maximum speed of Mach 2. We don't actually get to Mach 2 here, but that's partly for efficiency's sake. And here we are climbing. I took off from Cape Canaveral, and so we'll end up at Cape Canaveral of course. And you can see that as we approach 40,000 feet, I level out and then I dip down and we dump the pylon tanks. I have to highlight those and use the external stores selection to select the stores on the pylon and then we can release the pylon tanks and after that we can dive and then break the sound barrier. So the procedure is you use the pylon tanks to get to 40,000 feet, hang out there for as long as you can with the pylon tanks. Once the pylon tanks are done, drop them and then dive down and then you can break the sound barrier. The dive will auto sort of automatically happen if you try to break the sound barrier, and uh, you'll end up at about 31,000 feet. So, and that's if you're carrying the wingtip tanks. If you're not carrying the wingtip tanks, it's much easier to pass the speed of sound. So, anyway, back up to 40,000 feet, and I go all the way up to 53,000 feet here, as you can see, uh, but, the thing is that this plane, I don't know if it's configured exactly right for high altitudes because it doesn't seem to consume less fuel past 45,000 feet. Normally planes, because they're ingesting less oxygen at higher altitudes, they use less fuel. And that produces less thrust, but also there's less drag at higher altitudes. As you see that I've dropped the wingtip tanks now, and so we're just on internal fuel. But this uh, plane for some reason past about 45,000 feet doesn't consume less fuel and so the optimal place for it is basically at 45, 46,000 feet uh, as far as the range is concerned because as we go higher it, it seems to not get as much thrust as I would be expecting it to get uh, so I mean you would expect that it'd be different right if it's consuming the same amount of fuel that it had been before it would be getting more thrust and go really fast but it doesn't so, that's confusing to me. I don't know exactly what's up with it. But anyway, the upshot of that is that I, after doing many of these flights, where here I'm trying to get close to 60,000 feet, you see, I'm at 58,000 feet and climbing as we approach uh, well, New York Island there, Long Island, and not quite New York. I didn't fly directly over New York, and we're trying to land at Boston. And there's a good view of Rhode Island. But yeah, this conclusion about the fuel efficiency and what altitude to cruise at was came about by testing this on the first few flights of this certain navigation. So I was trying to feel out the altitudes and what kind of fuel consumption I was getting. And then after that, I stuck to about 46,000 feet uh, for cruising. So here we're descending for landing at Boston. You can see the caution because, that, because we are running out of fuel. Uh, so the range of it is about 1,000 nautical miles if we're trying to break the speed of sound and go really fast. Obviously if we were just hanging out below the speed of sound, it probably would get a little bit more range, but I wanted to fly fast obviously. I mean it's an F-104, why wouldn't you want to go as close to Mach 2 as possible? And I think I generally end up at Mach uh, 1.8. 
a little bit past Mach 1.8 once we've drip, uh, dropped the wingtip tanks. With the wingtip tanks, we can go Mach 1.6 something. So, yep, here we are coming in. Now, the F-104 is very pe peculiar because you have to maintain a certain amount of engine power in order to make sure that there's air going over the wings. Uh, it, the engine actually has bleed air going over the wings to make sure that it gets enough lift. If the engine quits, its uh, stall speed is much higher. So we have to keep up the engine power, but uh, we can do that with max flaps and also eventually using the air brakes. It actually stops pretty well. It doesn't take too long to slow down once it's hit the runway. So that at least is good because on a circumnavigation, sometimes we don't have really nice airports like this. I've plotted out 28 flights all together, and uh, again, of which I've done 16 so far as of recording this video. And some of them are fairly short airfields, like we're talking about 4,000 feet-ish. So a little bit challenging. Okay, so we shut off. And there we go. So that was the first flight. You can see it's been a while. It's been eight months. I've been very leisurely about doing these flights, but that was the first flight log between KTTS and Logan International. And here we're going from Logan to, of course, St. John's. Now, I'm not going to go through Europe on this flight because we can't sightsee anyway. So instead of doing the normal thing, uh, going through Eurasia, I'm actually going to go south into Africa and sort of take a more no novel route across the Indian Ocean to, uh, I think, Malaysia. Uh, uh, did I land in Malaysia? Anyway, across the Indian Ocean. Uh, we land in Sri Lanka, among, the, among other places, and Madagascar. So, different route than what might be thought of as usual, but again, because we're flying mostly high and fast, uh, there's no benefit to getting all the photogrammetry or anything like that that uh, seems to be all lumped in certain areas of the world. Anyway, here we are climbing proudly with our pylon tanks and wingtip tanks again out from Boston. And early on I was doing real-world weather and, and real-time, but eventually because of the mismatch between my time zone and other time zones, I'll stop doing real-time, but I'll always be doing real-world weather. In some places that will prove to be challenging, but you should know that I'm also using a little nav map, not just using the internal systems on the F-104, so that's why you might see that I don't have certain things configured because I'm basically using the equivalent of GPS. And I'm also using the stream deck to monitor my speed and all that stuff while I'm in the external view. So. I can see my speed and all the necessaries, including my fuel consumption, on the stream deck uh, because I want to get the external shots. So anyway, here we drop the pylon tanks and so we go ahead and go past the speed of sound. I think I already did the dip here. Ah uh, no, here I'm doing the dip to break the speed of sound here. So going past Mach 1, and basically you only need to do a small dip because then the transonic drag forces your nose down really hard. <laughs> so uh, you just need to avoid trying to pull up with it too soon because if you pull up with it too soon, you'll drop below Mach 1 very quickly. Uh, instead, you need to make sure when flying this plane to get past about Mach 1.3 or uh, maintain 400 knots indicated airspeed at least. I usually go for, yeah, about 400 knots indicated airspeed. Just maintain that and make sure you don't dip below it and then it'll go through as you climb. So you can climb as long as you're past 400 knots indicated. So pretty thick cloud cover there. Uh, usually the approach to St. John's involves really low visibility. I mean, at least a lot of times when I've flown to Newfoundland, it's not been the easiest thing to spot the airport. But I think this time around it was clear actually at St. John's. I am using the afterburner all the way. There's no reason not to. And of course, we're trying to stay past the speed of sound. So just um, burning all that as quickly as possible. And Generally, the flights are between 900 and 1,000 nautical miles, though some might fall a little bit shorter of that. So we're basically taking an hour between locations. So each flight is an hour. And that's the fuel warning light to show that that tank is done. So we are done with the wingtip tanks, and I release them. So you have to highlight the dots on the left panel there, lower left panel, and 
then the switch to the wingtip tanks on the switch that's somewhat behind the control column, and then press the release button, which hopefully you have mapped to your joystick. So, over Nova Scotia there, and now free of all the tankage. And the difference between the Sim Skunk Works uh, F-104 and practically any other plane for flight sim is that it simulates the drag of the tanks. That's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to fly, especially when it has the tanks, because it has a lot of drag from those tanks. And that's why with the pylon tanks, you can't really go convincingly past Mach 1. You can get to Mach 1, but you can't stay past Mach 1 very well. And then so you have to drop the pylon tanks in order to get past Mach 1. And so you might as well use all the fuel from them before that. And then the wingtip tanks, you can't get too far past Mach 1.6 uh, with them. You, to get from 1.6 to 1.8, you really need to lose the wingtip tanks. So yeah, that's one of the special things about the Sims Concours F104 that attracted me to its fidelity because it's got that part of the aerodynamics down right, which is rare in flight sim right now so hopefully maybe i don't know how flight sim 2020 is going to work out but hopefully they do a better job of simulating external tanks like that i don't know if that's their plan or not because of course uh, they don't plan to have weapon systems and maybe they might see it as bombs or something i don't know uh, so anyway here we are approaching our landing site and descending so the final setting on the flaps basically acts like air brakes, uh, and uh, I mean, which you know landing flaps often do. And but much more extreme for the F104. I feel like the final setting on the flaps actually ensures that you're staying staying at the right speed for landing. It's actually fairly useful. Uh, it's it's a solid flap setting. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, it's basically essential for landing the safe one. And here we are, a fine clear day at St. John's, oddly enough. And here we go. That's the landing gear. And here we are on approach. I feel like though, maybe I, I figured out the necessity of that flap setting um, maybe a little bit after this flight. Because I don't think I would be going this fast into St. John's if I had the flaps configured right. I wonder though. Oop, a little bit of a hiccup. That's another problem when we're landing the F-104 because it's coming in relatively fast. Uh, the scenery loading leads to jitters. It leads to low frame rate on approach sometimes. That does make it a little bit harder. Anyway, so here we are. I never used a drag chute. I think it has a drag chute, but I never use it. The landing occurs pretty quickly. The tough thing with the F-104 is actually getting it off the ground. As we see the flight from Boston to St. John's, CYYT, one hour and eight minutes there. Next up was the flight to Greenland, of course, Narsarswak. Uh, we don't have many options as far as crossing the Atlantic. The F-104 certainly can't cross the Atlantic on its own. And so we're going to Greenland. And it's a shorter than normal flight, 852 nautical miles. But again, we don't have a whole lot of fields to choose from. And so here we go. Uh, at this point, I'm still sort of trying to get used to the plane and figuring out exactly how to fly it optimally, uh, including getting it off the ground. Actually, I find takeoff to be very difficult sometimes uh, because you go really fast and you've got this huge load on the wings too and ridiculously small wings. Have I mentioned, I haven't mentioned the ridiculously small wings. I got to see the F-104 in person at uh, the Evergreen Aviation Museum in Oregon recently and they had the protective covers on the leading edge of the wings so that because Otherwise, people might cut themselves because the, we, the leading and trailing edge of the wings are so sharp, so they add covers on them. Yeah, it's a really tiny wing and really sharp. So, yeah, here we go, dipping down to break the sound barrier again. Now, these early flights are particularly stressful because I was flying it manually all the way without any autopilot. Normally, I would fly a plane like this manually all the way without any autopilot, but it does tend to vary a lot in altitude without the autopilot. Uh, trying to trim it out is very difficult. So eventually, 
the reason why I didn't use the autopilot was partly because I didn't trust it. Because previously, when I had tried to engage it, it went crazy. The plane would went, go crazy. But it seems like if you turn it off and on again a few times and try and stabilize the plane between those uh, flicks, uh, eventually it'll click with it and it'll be all right. But something about going Mach 1.6 doesn't make the autopilot particularly happy. Uh, so uh, it does take some toggling to make sure that it's happy with it. And so later flights, I'll use the autopilot. But here, I'm still not using the autopilot. And that's just so that it'll just keep to an altitude. Here, I'm still trying to feel out what altitude would be best for our fuel consumption. So it didn't particularly make sense to use it anyway. But eventually, I figure out that, uh, you know, like I said, 45,000, 46,000 was pretty good. And so I eventually make use of the autopilot for the short amount of time that we can use the autopilot, right? Because we have to basically get to the point where we dump the pylon and tip tanks first, and then make sure that we get to the right altitude and then set the autopilot. The autopilot is very rudimentary. It's just got an altitude hold and wing leveler, basically. And so even to turn, you can't set a heading, you have to just have it turn left or turn right, there's a toggle. The, make the plane turn left, make the tur plane turn right. It doesn't hold a particular heading. So it's a very simple autopilot. And basically you can use it for maybe half an hour of one of these flights at most. So anyway, here I'm still trying to feel out the proper altitude. So I'm at 52,000 feet. And we are approaching Greenland here. So again, the reason why I don't go higher is because it doesn't seem to go faster at higher altitudes. And I don't know why, but because it's consuming the same amount of fuel. And I do actually remember it having different dynamics in earlier versions of Flight Sim. And I don't think it has been updated recently. Though, since I've already embarked on this flight, I'm not updating it during the circumnavigation. But I had updated it before starting the certain navigation, and it seems like previous versions of Flight Sim had an easier time getting to Mach 2, but something changed. Um, so, yeah, maybe there is a new update that I haven't seen yet that might fix things or change things, but I don't want to change things now that I'm in the middle of the circuit navigation. We'll keep the dynamics the same. I certainly don't want to have to learn again because it's a difficult plane to fly. So I want to keep things consistent now that we've embarked upon this journey. So Greenland, uh, this I think was before the Greenland update, if I recall correctly. I don't think it would have made much of a difference. So here we are landing at Narsarswak or however it is pronounced. Prior to starting the circumnavigation, I actually practiced the flight from St. John's to Narsaswak a few times because that's just a normal test flight to see whether your plane can do it, that has the range. And also that was where I felt out how to break the sound barrier with it and all that stuff and made sure that I did that efficiently because there are a lot of inefficient ways to break the sound barrier with the plane. Uh, I needed to make sure that I broke the sound barrier quickly and efficiently. So, as I find a parking spot here at Greenland, I'm going to wrap this up for this video. There's been three flights of the planned 28 flights uh, around the world with the F-104. So, as I park next to a mysteriously unmarked airliner, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.